I got my master's degree in economics and I came back about two and a half years ago wanting to work as a lecturer and I joined the movement as a human rights activist um, about a year and a half ago because I, I felt that there's gross violations of human rights in this country and there must be someone who do, do something about it. Virak is now trying to teach Cambodians, like these residents of Group 78, how to fight the illegal evictions. But in a system where judges' verdicts are often for sale, money is proving far stronger than law. The prices of land, I think, have increased by sevenfold over the last five or six years, and that's an enormous increase. So the temptations are enormous, and that means the injustices also potentially can be very enormous. It's unclear who's making money out of all this because the government sells the land in secret. But critics believe corrupt officials are making millions, selling land at a massive profit and paying peanuts in compensation. When people moved here in the 1980s, it was just worthless marshland. But as the city has grown, it's become some of the most sought after real estate in the capital. And the villages behind there have already been cleared out for commercial development. And the city governor wants to build a road through Group 78. And between the village and the site of the new national parliament is the site for the new Australian embassy cheek by jowl for now with one of Phnom Penh's poorest slums. The embassy bought the land from a powerful Australian Cambodian businessman who's also an advisor to the Prime Minister. A former refugee in Australia, 36-year-old Kit Meng now owns a pro-government TV station, the main mobile phone company, a betting agency and a half share in ANZ's Cambodian banking interest. While there's no suggestion illegal evictions happened on the embassy site, residents have been forcibly evicted from other land that Kit Meng has acquired. It's common for city police to act as muscle for property developers. <laughs> On the other side of Group 78 from the Australian Embassy site, uniformed police were working as security guards for the new owners of yet more land ready for development. All of them were forced to sell their properties. Really, they have no choice. As you can see, this is actually a huge island, empty now, and it's all owned by companies closely linked to the Prime Minister. As a US citizen, Virak is one of the few Cambodians brave enough to speak out publicly about what many complain of privately. The enormous wealth and power of Prime Minister Hun Sen and his network of friends and associates. Certainly he's one of the rich man in, in Cambodia and probably one of the richest men in the world. There's always cases that him or his relative or his in-laws um, end up being the owner of some land concessions by the government. The Prime Minister is a former Khmer Rouge commander who wields near absolute power. So, human rights groups have urged Western powers to protest about the land grabs. Foreign donors provide half of Cambodia's national budget, and Australia gives almost $15 million a year through its aid agency, AusAid. This building right here is the new National Assembly building that they're putting up. Directly across this road here, you'll see the land allotted for the new Australian embassy. Mm -hmm. But Henry Huang, a US lawyer representing evicted landholders, says the Australian embassy has refused to speak out. What's disturbing about this, I would say, are two things. First is that AusAid actually is a very generous donor to the development of Cambodia. And two of the three priority areas are strengthening the rule of law, 
and the second is reducing the vulnerability of the poor. Now here you have the poorest of the poor, and here you have the new Australian embassy slated to be built right in the heart of this, and yet they haven't said a thing about this issue. Embassy staff declined to be interviewed, issuing a statement that they had no responsibility for any land around the site. US Ambassador Joseph Musamili is far more outspoken. There's too many land disputes, there's too many rich people, greedy people or greedy companies. This is something that goes to the livelihood of millions of Cambodians. And if they want to maintain political stability here, the political parties, especially the parties in control right now, have to do more to redress this issue. The land grabs are even more serious in poor rural communities, where three quarters of the population survives on subsistence farming. In some places, officials have given private companies land grants of up to 300,000 hectares, 30 times more than the law allows. If you stop by a village anywhere in the country, you're probably going to discover by talking to the villagers that the, the village will be affected by the land grabbing. Tapum is a typical village, carved out of the jungle in the 1980s by survivors of the Khmer Rouge. Two years ago, the government gave their land, along with ten other villages, to a nearby state rubber plantation in partnership with a private company. A village councillor told us the rubber company's president and his deputy had close links to Cambodia's first family. The current owner is the um, in-laws of the, the Hun San family mm -hmm. as well. And also the vice president is, is, um, is marrying to the niece of Hun San. The village chief, like most other people with any power in Cambodia, is a member of Hun Sen's party, the CPP, and wasn't keen on helping us with our inquiries. What do you think of the situation here where people's land has been taken by the rubber plantation? I think you're doing welcome from uh, that part of Australia. Yeah, but no. it's, it's, um, it's for the company to resolve. Mm -hmm. But uh, isn't it the people's land?